Jesus Christ. But to do that, we need an, uh, an ingredient, if I can put it that way, that we do not naturally possess. Now, the Bible calls it agape. And you've heard us talk about that quite a bit. And when we have this gift, which comes from God, this gift of agape, we will be able to practice what Paul is teaching. You remember in the upper room the night that Jesus was betrayed? Uh, he was there with the disciples and they had the Last Supper. Well, he made this statement to his disciples. It's found in John 13, verses 34 and 35, and I'm sure you're very familiar with it, but I want to share it with you again. A new commandment I give you. You love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You may remember that when Jesus spoke these words, the disciples weren't very loving toward each other, were they? They were arguing over who was going to be first in the kingdom. And, you know, and Jesus says, hey, that's not the kingdom of God, fellas. You must love one another just as I have loved you. We, uh, as we have gone through this book of Romans, we have found that because of our sinful natures, that kind of love doesn't come naturally, does it? So I want to point you back to Revelation, not Revelation, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13. You might remember a couple weeks ago when we were in Romans 13, we looked at this because it's here that Paul describes the love Jesus is speaking of as the greatest gift. And keep in mind that the context is spiritual gifts. We all know that the greatest gift is Jesus Christ. Amen? But in context of spiritual gifts, this is the greatest gift, agape. Now, I, I, I know that you have read this many times, and we have read, like I said, two weeks ago. So I want to share with you a video that is going to say it a little different. So many meanings, so many feelings attached to it, so many definitions, so many experiences. We think we know what it means, but honestly, it's, it's been distorted, misrepresented, misunderstood, misused so much that perhaps we've lost sight of its real meaning. Poets, philosophers, songwriters, filmmakers, painters, dancers, businessmen, scientists, congressmen, everybody's tried to express its meaning. Some get close, others are way off. Some refuse to accept where it comes from, still others act like they don't need it, while others try to convince us that it's just a basic function of the brain. John Lennon said it's all we need. Pat Benatar said it's a battlefield. Sinatra, for all you old people out there, said it's a mini splendored thing, whatever that means. To be honest, we've all thrown the word around in some glib reference to ice cream or a football team as if the word is interchangeable between products and people. And I'm not trying to knock that. It's just that sometimes I really want to know what a word means. It kind of helps in conversations and human communication. But this word, huh, can we really define it? Is it too ambiguous, too morphed from its original meaning, too mysterious we can't even expect anything from it? Well, maybe, maybe the creator of its original meaning should be consulted. So let's glean from his book and see how he defines it, shall we? Agape. That's the New Testament word for love that I'm talking about. The kind of love that we're all really longing for and nothing else even comes close. This is the kind of love when demonstrated properly changes everything. It's an active and unconditional love. It's the kind of love that says I'll never think of myself first. Everything I do is for someone else. It's the kind of love that says I'll be rejected so you can be accepted. I'll be humiliated so you can be lifted up. It's the kind of love that says I'll sit this one out for the good of the team. I'll move to the back so my friend can move up front. It's a rare love that proves its merit by action. The kind that wakes up every morning and asks, how can I outserve everyone around me today? The kind of love that when there's only three tickets to a U2 concert and four people want to go, your friend says he'll catch them the next time they're in town. It's a motivational love that says, don't worry because I got your back. You can do all things with me on your side. It's the kind of love that says, I'm with you always. I'll provide for you. I'll sit with you beside still waters and I'll go before you in battle. It whispers, I forgive you, and it shouts, I'm your best friend. 
It leads you to truth. It steers you from harm. It's the kind of love that can't be earned, that can't be bought, that won't leave you, that won't forsake you, and that won't misjudge you. It's a rare kind of love that will tackle you to the ground so you won't fall off a cliff. This is the kind of love that's better than life, stronger than death. It's patient. It's kind. It always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Agape love is unmerited. It's unmovable. It's unshakable. It's undeniable, indestructible, secure, sensitive, and straightforward. It's the kind of love that builds up. It seeks the lost. It befriends enemies. It corrects. It guides. It comforts. It reassures. In the simplest of terms and maybe most complete definition, it's the kind of love that says, I'll die so you can live. That's the kind of love. That's the spiritual gift that we should all be long, longing for. It's the greatest gift of all. Back to Romans 15. I want you to look at verse 3. There's uh, an important point in this verse that I, I want to point out. And the New Testament presents Jesus in two ways. It presents Jesus as our Savior but it also presents Jesus as our example. I, I feel I, I need to mention this because there are some who tend to emphasize Jesus as an example. Yes, he is our example, but first and primarily, he's our Savior. Now, the, at, he first redeems us. He first gives us peace. He first gives us justification. That's what Paul is dealing with and telling us about in the first half of Romans. And now he's saying, having accepted Jesus as your Savior, having accepted Christ as your life, I want to present him to you as an example. Look at verse 3, Romans 15. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Now, Paul is quoting from Psalms 69, verse 9, which is a messianic uh, prophecy. So, what is he trying to tell us? Just this. All the blame, not only the sins, but all the blame that is heaped upon God, Jesus took. All the blame that was heaped upon the human race, Jesus took. And this is how it applies to us today. This is the point Paul is trying to get at. There are many today who are blaming God for all the terrible things that are happening in the world. Paul is saying in verse 3, what he's saying is that Jesus was willing to take the blame for something he had not done. It's one thing to accept the blame for something that you have done, but it's another thing to accept the blame for something that you haven't done. So using Jesus as our example... Paul is saying, I want you to take the blame for the mistakes done by those who are babes in Jesus Christ. Did you get that? I want you to take the blame for the mistakes that are made by those who are babes in Jesus Christ. You see, we are experts at pointing out the things that others have done that are wrong, aren't we? <laughs> but to take the blame of somebody else, how can I do that? That's not easy, is it? The truth is, it takes the grace of God to be able to do that. For that to happen, we have to stop looking at ourselves in the church as individuals. And, and I know this is difficult to understand in America because, you know, we're, we're a, 
a nation that supports individuality. But in the church, we must look at ourselves in the context of a corporate identity. You with me so far? Okay. I'll give you an illustration. It's found in the book of Daniel in chapter 9. If you, if you never have, have never read that, that chapter, read it sometime. Because in that chapter, Daniel is praying. He doesn't, and he doesn't say, the Jews have gone wrong, Lord. No. He says, we have gone wrong. You see, we have sinned. He identifies himself with the people of the church. Are we willing to identify ourselves with the mistakes of our fellow believers? Good question, isn't it? You see, if we are going to use Jesus as an example, the answer to that is yes. And then in verses 4 and 5, having quoted Psalm 69 in verse 9, Paul says this, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity, among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ. Basically, he's saying, I'm not teaching you anything new. The words uh, written in the past, Paul meant in the Old Testament. You understand that when Paul wrote this, there was no New Testament as we know it today. There was only the Old Testament. And so, for us today, though, we not only have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament as well. So we have the whole Bible, don't we? Well, Paul is saying that the whole Bible, all things written in the Bible, were written for our learning. So that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. In other words, the Bible and the Bible only must be our guideline, must be our standard, and must be the direction for us. And as I look to the Scripture to find a a biblical example of that kind of Christian, the first name that came to my mind, you might guess, was Barnabas. He's first introduced in the book of Acts in verses 32 and 37. And I want you to notice the unity of the church that Luke describes. And I know no other place in the New Testament where there is such an intense description of a caring church. Notice this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. There was no need, excuse me, there was no needy person among them, from time, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone as he had need. What do you think would happen if our church were known as that kind of church? And I'm not suggesting that you go, oh, everybody rush out and sell your home. That's not what I'm saying. But there is a principle there, isn't there? It's in this atmosphere that we find Barnabas. Acts 4 and and verses 36 to 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means sons of of encouragement, 
sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. I want you to take just, just a few minutes and look at some of the traits that caused the apostles to give Barnabas the nickname Son of Encouragement. The first trait is found in Acts chapter 9. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. You understand why they had that problem, right? I mean, not too far in the distant past, Paul was running around trying to kill and put any Christian he could in prison. But then he had his experience on the Damascus Road. And Paul was transformed. Notice what verse 27 says. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Another incident illustrating that same trait is found in Acts 15. This is where Paul and Barnabas have uh, joined together and they've gone out on uh, an evangelistic tour or or a missionary journey. And they've taken along with them a, a young man by the name of John Mark. Now when they get to Perga, they have a really difficult time. There's no money and they have to deal with a lot of persecution. Things are really discouraging. So John Mark, in discouragement, gives up and goes home, a battered and beaten person. Paul and Barnabas continue on the journey. But eventually they return to Jerusalem, and after a rest they decide to go on another missionary journey. And again, John Mark wants to go with them. Paul must have been, at first, a a very difficult man, a very strong-willed man, because he said, there is no way. He sees Mark as a quitter. He sees Mark as, as one that cannot be part of his team. And so Paul and Barnabas part company, and Barnabas takes John Mark. Have you ever thought about what would have happened had not John Mar- had not Barnabas taken John Mark? Maybe we wouldn't have had the gospel of Mark. If Barnabas hadn't taken and picked up a battered, beaten young man and made him feel good about himself again. Back to Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. And this time, I want to add verse 7. We who are strong ought to bear with the the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. In verse 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. It is a prayer of mine that this church would be known for its sons and daughters of encouragement. That same prayer is for the Jupiter Church as well. See, we, we have been called to liberate each other. We, we, with the forgiveness and, and the acceptance of Christ. You know, we must never forget, for all have sinned. That includes you and me. And fallen short of the glory of God. And we've all been accepted by Jesus Christ. When he went to the cross of Calvary, he went for every single person on this earth. And 
when we come to church to worship, we should all feel liberated from any fears of judgment and censor. We should feel, uh, not feel any rejection from those things when, when we just don't measure up. And I'm sure that every now and then all of us have been in that situation. You see, in our church, we need to work at developing an atmosphere so that when children or adults look up and, and catch us looking at them, they will immediately know that they are loved and that we are supporting. You know, one of, one of the greatest things for me that, that I look forward to with heaven is not golden streets. It's not mansions. It's to be in an atmosphere of pure, unconditional love. To me, that's what heaven is all about. No more suffering. No more dying be in the presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all the angels, and within that atmosphere, there is an atmosphere of perfect love. I long for that. We should have the beginning as close as we can on this earth of that kind of atmosphere. Don't you agree? Tony Campalo, in his sermon entitled Friday but Sunday's Coming, he makes this observation about Jewish mothers. He states that the Jewish culture has built into motherhood the idea that the responsibility of a mother is to build up her child. The Jewish child grows up with his mother telling him or her that he or she is bright, they're they're brilliant, they can do great things. That child can go out and flunk the first grade and their mother will say, goes to show you they don't know how to educate a genius down at that school. I believe if believers, including children, are in an atmosphere with fellow believers that think that they're great, they are going to become as great as their church thinks they can be. I believe that. What if our church demonstrated that kind of thinking? Barnabas was like that. I want you to look at verse 7 again of Romans 15. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. In the book, Acts of the Apostles, is written, written this statement about Barnabas. Let me give you a little background first. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had preached in Lystra, and and the people uh, were just so excited. They said that they were gods, and they've come down, and, and they were going to worship them. But notice what it says. Barnabas they called Jupiter because of his venerable appearance, his dignified bearing, and the mildness and benevolence expressed in his countenance. There was something about Barnabas that said, this man is a spiritual man and that enhanced the church. You see, I believe whether you're male or female, we can be a Barnabas in this church. What do people remember about you when we, well, I I have to include me in that too. 
I'm wondering, what do they say about us when we walk away from them? When people spend time with us, do they walk away better for it? I want you to look at verse 2 again, Romans 15. And I know we're, I'm having you look at these more than once because I want them to stay in here, okay? Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. The issue and, and the point I want you to take home with you is is when you and I have a sense of our own self-worth that the gospel gives in which we understand our own sinfulness and how much we are loved by God we are free then and believe me only then to turn our attention constructively to others. Can you agree with that? That's when we begin to grow strong in the faith. When we begin to grow up, as I, I, if I can say it that way, as Christians, we understand how valuable people are to God. And because they are so valuable to God, they should be valuable to us too, don't you think? So I'll close by reading Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another. And then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. That's the kind of church we want. That's the kind of Christians we want to be. And with all our failures and faults, and we all have them, I know God can transform us into that kind of Christian. Amen? Let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus. I I, I thank you for the promises and the words of encouragement and help that you have given us in this book of Romans. I thank you for Paul, who you used in a mighty way to help us to understand the gospel and the character of God. Oh, Father, may it not be just a sermon they've heard or a scripture they've read. Transform us, O oh Lord, to be like Jesus. Change us into his character, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.